Uh, next speaker is Professor Jan Blomgren, that has a career as a encompass all aspects of nuclear technology, starting in research and education at a university, moving on to nuclear strategy and policy management in the corporate world, as well as business training for all levels of management. His present position is targeting top-level nuclear business management. Um, he's an internationally recognized speaker, trainer, and advisor to companies, governments, and international organizations on nuclear business issues. And he's author of the book, Everything You Need to Know About Sweden's Electricity Supply. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks, John Constable, for stealing all my talk. Uh, <laughs> I can essentially underline everything that has been said, and I'm going to present you a few examples taken on top of my head. Uh, the, the title of this day is Wind Industry at What Cost? And I'm going to provide the answer, high and rising. Uh, we have you spent enormous amounts of tax money in Europe to make all electricity generation unprofitable. The reason is that we have made ourselves dependent on production which we cannot control. When the wind blows, we get a both anorectic and bulimic situation. When the wind does not blow, we have anorexia. We don't get the energy we need to our system. And then when the wind blows, a lot, then we get bulimic, we get more than we can handle. And from the point of view of the poor electric grid, both are very difficult to handle. And for the financial system, it means that suppose that you have favorable wind conditions, say one third of the time or a quarter of the time or something like that. Let's make it 30% just to make it easy. That means that all the other ways of producing electricity we need electricity 24 seven. That means they lose income during one third of their time. You can handle that if you have an old facility which was built back in time, you have paid off the investment and now you just have operational costs to cover. But that's not sufficient to build new plants that operate 24 seven, the type of energy which is dispatchable that you control that you get electricity when you need it. So now we have run ourselves into the situation that thanks to the enormous spending of tax money, we have got a wind industry that doesn't make profit and it erodes the possibility for every other way of, of producing electricity to cover the cost to build new plants. We can continue operating old plants, but we can't get finances in building new plants in this situation. And therefore, I voted yes to join the European Union some 25 years ago, because at that time the European Union was a pro-market economy. I doubt that today. What we've seen now is that we have come into a situation where we made all the electricity generation in Europe a communist activity. Everything has been made uh, unprofitable thanks to spending lots of tax money. And now we're in the situation that we need to spend more and more tax money to compensate for the tax money we've already thrown in there. We're burning money, so the costs are high and they are rising. But that's only on the generation side. However, I spent a year of my life due to COVID. I lost all my clients during COVID because I couldn't travel. So I wrote a book about the, the power grids in Sweden and I figured out this essentially the same all over Europe. The generation side is only half the story. Uh, you often hear the phrase, oh, we need all electricity. That's a deeply anti-intellectual statement. Because all ways of creating electricity are not equal, and they affect the power grid, the system, in different ways. Electricity is a highly integrated system. You can actually argue that all the electricity generation and all the, all the users and all the power lines in between, they are actually just one big machine. Everything goes together, and everything affects it, each other. I'm going to be a little bit uh, technical here. In large-scale, heavy 
generation. That means fossil plants, nuclear plants, large-scale hydropower plants. You have so-called synchronous generators. In Sweden, if something is incomprehensible, we say, that sounds like Greek to me. Sorry, all my Greek friends. Uh, but the word synchronous is actually Greek. Syn means at the same and chronos time. That means generators that produce the 50 hertz of frequency which we use in our electricity grid in all over Europe. That is, they have generators that stabilize the production. You can steer that you get exactly uh, the revolutions 50 per second that you need to keep everything under control. If you go 1% off that value, you close down the entire continent because you can't operate it. Uh, so these large heavy installations, they are essential for the steering and control and thereby for the stability of the power supply to the entire continent. What has happened the last 20 years is that we have closed down lots of synchronous generation and replaced with a synchronous generation. A is also Greek and means not. So that means the generators you have in wind farms and even worse, in solar, solar systems, they work completely different. But anyway, in wind farms, you have generators that cannot be used to steer and control what you're producing. You get what you get. The, the generators in those, they act like this. Okay, the generation today is 49.98. Well, then I also run 49.98. They follow what's happening in the system, but you can't use them to stabilize. You can't use them to steer the system back in case you are off the target value for everything. And that means when you get changes in the wind, you get disturbances of the entire system. And if you don't have these heavy elephants on a skewer rotating all the time in fossil plants, in nuclear and large scale hydro, you start to get much more fluctuations in your power system. And now we come to exactly what John Constable mentioned, that costs money. I can just give you a quick number. Uh, in Sweden, we have gone from one to 20 billion Swedish kronor, that's about two billion euro, over a five year period, just for compensation of the disturbances that has been produced in our, in, in our power system. And that is essentially all of it due to wind power. We're now to such an extent that the cost just for stabilizing the, the lack of stability produced by wind power in other parts of the system, which you don't see on your normal electric bill, in four years you can build a new nuclear power plant of that, which would produce as much as the entire wind fleet more or less. So we have come into a situation where we spend enormous amounts of, that is, tax money to compensate for the problems created in the wind industry. At the same time, we have made the same study as uh, Constable uh, referred to on Swedish grounds. 85% of all the wind companies, operational companies, they make loss. The average loss is 15%. That means in six or seven years, you erode the entire uh, capital of the, of the company. Of the, of the 15%, I, I'm not saying they make loss. They don't make, well, we have 15% that don't make loss. I don't say they make profit. They don't make loss. They make so small profit that not a single one of the, of the wind companies in Sweden pays dividends to their shareholders. And that's the whole purpose of a limited liability company, not a single one of them. So what this is really about is uh, an activity financed by tax money. And one, we have realized the one important uh, source of income for these companies is green subsidies from the European Union. What happens is that you can get a bank loan for very low interest rate if you can put a green flag on your project. Uh, it turns out that essentially all wind power in Sweden is owned from elsewhere. China is the largest owner, 
Uh, the single largest owner is the Chinese state-owned nuclear power company, CGN. And you can start to think why on earth they should run wind power in Sweden. Secondly, we have Switzerland and Luxembourg. So it's, com- it's not Swedish companies. It's international companies. They start a, subs- a subsidiary in Sweden, which they can let go bankrupt when it's time to clean up the mess in a few years. Uh, they get green subsidies from Brussels at extremely low interest rates because it's a green project and it will save the world. The Swedish company is operated at zero profit or somewhat loss. That Swedish company, they now have to, to loan money from the mother company in Luxembourg to an interest rate which is four or five times higher than the interest rate the mother company in Luxembourg gets from the from Brussels. And that means this is a way of greenwashing subsidies. The, this entire thing makes uh, people with terribly expensive suits in London and similar places very happy so they can throw champagne on each other. This is what happens with If if you can misuse a system, people will misuse the system, and that's exactly what we've seen. Okay, but let me then summarize. Now we're talking about all these various different aspects, but please let us take one step back and think a little bit. Uh, we have had a medical doctor giving a presentation. We have seen pictures of the human respiratory system. Suppose that you are in charge of a hospital. You have patients that have difficulties breathing. It's your job to buy a machine that helps human beings breathing so they don't die. You have two different technologies to choose from. One in which sometimes you don't get any air at all. Sometimes you get far more oxygen than the patient can handle. You cannot control it. It changes, it fluctuates violently. Or you can go for a system that works 24-7, gives the right amount of of oxygen to the patient every second in in the day, and you control how much should be given. Pick your choice. And then remember that electricity, that is what keeps poverty away. That is the basis for a high civilization with high quality of living. Electricity is the oxygen of civilization. And I turn to the European policymakers, make relevant choices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Blomgren. Is there anyone who have any questions? Uh, my name is Samuel Young. I'm the assistant to uh, Mr. Ross, uh, and I have a question to uh, Professor Blomgren, because when discussing the costs of wind energy with proponents of it, they always claim that the costs of wind energy are decreasing rapidly and that the profits are actually going up quite rapidly because of innovation. Why is this untrue and what would you say to those proponents of wind energy? Well, the reason it's untrue is that it's based on on expectations. Uh, Another way of saying is that it's based on wishful thinking. Uh, I see exactly the same thing in my home turf that they say that, well, in a few years we will have this cost and so on. Uh, But when, when John Constable in the UK and people I know in Sweden actually go in and look at the audited numbers from the operators, they are, right, they are read all of them. So that's simply a lie. Uh, secondly, what they talk about is only the actual production cost of the electricity without looking into its intrinsic value. That is, they don't look into the costs that are produced elsewhere by eroding the power grid in other places, but they're also not looking into what is the financial value when you get it. When you have lots of wind, it means that you have an excess of it. 
it means that the value is very low. That's not taken into account in their calculations. And it's not taken into account how expensive it is to produce something else when it's not blowing. So it's, it, it's, real, it's really, well, it's okay to make uh, arguments that uh, support your position, uh, but this is taken to the limit, I would say, or rather beyond.